If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Hosea. Just start with chapter 1. That's where we will uh, start off this morning. So in Sunday school, Justin Taylor said that uh, since he went long, if I needed to go long this morning, just to go ahead. So if we go long, y'all just stare at Justin Taylor, not me. I'm joking. Uh, we shouldn't go long. My notes are actually shorter this morning than typically. Now, that doesn't mean anything, honestly. Uh, but in theory, we shouldn't go as long as, and we don't go long. Uh, I'm not even going to say that. We go the perfect amount of time. All right, so... So far, all the prophets that we have looked at, as we've gotten into the prophets, uh, that we have looked at, have all dealt with Judah. If you remember, after Solomon, Solomon's son, uh, Rehoboam, uh, becomes king, and there's this split between uh, the northern tribes of Israel, which uh, when you get to Hosea in your reading, they call it Ephraim. Uh, is what they refer to uh, the northern tribes because that was the biggest tribe. And then the southern uh, two tribes of uh, the Levites and Judah and half the tribe of Benjamin. So you got Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Judah were the ones that stayed more faithful for longer than the northern tribes of Israel. Uh, Israel went into captivity first by the Assyrians. And so while Hosea is a prophet, it's during the time of Jeroboam II. So he was one of the last kings of Israel. Israel before before the Assyrians come in so before we get into Hosea's story I want us to see where Israel is at during this time of Hosea's uh, prophecy because right now for Israel it is a time of peace it is a time of just kind of a financial or economic boom they are they are very uh, uh, they have wealth they have money things are going well on a, on a social and economic level for the nation but morally morally they are bankrupt if you remember when they came to the promised land, God told them to chase out or to uh, eradicate uh, the Canaanites that lived around them. Because if they did not, uh, the, the Israelites would be tempted by the false gods, the idols of the Canaanites. So that's what happened. And what happens is the Israelites begin to fully embrace the worship of Baal. Baal was one of the chief gods of the Canaanites. He was, they believed, that he was the weather god uh, who had control over agriculture, fertility, uh, rainfall, productivity. And so since Israel was an agricultural society, uh, they saw, well, all these other people are worshiping Baal and they're agricultural, so maybe we should do this as well. Now, they still called themselves the people of God. They still kind of kept God quasi in their culture and in their society, but it was really a name only. In practice, in word, and in deed, they were much more Canaanite than they were Israelite. So not only is idolatry bad, we know it's, it's one of the Ten Commandments, don't have no other gods before me. So the worship of God, or, or Baal, uh, was bad. But not only that they worshipped him, but it was how they worshipped him. Now we're not going to do a full breakdown of the religion, but understand that the worship of Baal, it included uh, drunkenness, uh, self-mutilation, human sacrifice, bestiality and incest and in fact the biggest part of their worship involved men going to the temple where they would pick out a temple prostitute mostly female but there were some male temple prostitutes and while they uh, engaged in intimacy they would pray this prayer uh, over and over they would say I beseech the goddess, uh, goddess of a start to favor you and Baal to favor me and they believed once they had slept with the prostitute, and then Baal would provide for them rain for their crops, and their crops would grow, and uh, their, their seeds would be fertile. That was their worship. Israel had moved from worshiping the one true God to engaging in all types of, of immorality, from sacrificing children to gross sexual immorality. Basically, whatever they thought would, would get Baal's attention, they would do. And the more vile, the more willing he was to listen. So this is what's going on in Israel when Hosea comes on to the stage. So look at Hosea chapter 1. We're going to just start by reading verses 2 and 3. So God gives Hosea a very peculiar uh, way to deliver his message. 
So he didn't just come to, to Hosea in a dream or in a vision or audibly and say, hey, here's what I want you to tell Israel. He does that, but he adds a caveat to that. Look at verses 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diplame, and she conceived and bore him a son. God chooses to use Hosea and his marriage to Gomer as a very visual picture to the Israelites. Now, there are some who say that uh, when, when God calls him to go and take a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom uh, because Israel is, is, is engaged in this, this uh, uh, idolatry, that he's telling him to go and, and marry a prostitute. Well, there are some who think that. I, I, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that as he marries Gomer, that Mary, as he marries Gomer, that, that everything is good at the beginning. It tells us that she bears him a son. Uh, that, that's, that's his son, not anybody else's, which we'll look at that more in a second. But also, this, this marriage, this relationship is a picture of Israel and God. With God being the husband and Israel being the wife. Much like God and the church, or Christ and the church today. He is the bridegroom and we are uh, the bride. Israel and God start off well. The relationship starts off good with them acknowledging God and saying, we are going to be your people and we're going to follow you. As you look at once they become a nation, uh, you get past Saul, but then you've got David and you've got Solomon. And that's when they start to finally start moving into idolatry uh, with Solomon and his multitude of wives who all lead him and the nation into uh, idolatry. And so they start off well, but then God says, understand that this is not going to continue to go well. Because Israel has engaged in the whoredom of idolatry, is what he says. Your wife is going to do exactly the same thing. And then not only that, not only that, but then you're going to have these children. Um, these children that represent or point towards her sin. Look at verses 6 through 9. It says, She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name, No Mercy. For I will have no mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name, not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now understand first, before we get into the what's being said and everything, understand God is not angry at these children. God is not mad at these children. God is not taking out his anger or frustration on his children. They are quote-unquote innocent in this situation or in this scenario. But they are, they are very obvious, very visible um, evidences of Gomer's sin. Of her, of her uh, immorality, of her uh, moving away from Hosea and engaging in uh, vast sexual relationships with other men. She's having these other children outside of her marriage. And so God uses them as, as pictures to say, look, Israel, this is what you do to me. And when you begin to worship other gods and you begin to partake in their worship and all of this, this gross uh, immorality... These children are just, while they might be good or innocent of this idolatry and everything else, they are pictures of the result of sin. And the result of your sin, Israel, is no mercy and you are no longer my people. Now understand, God is not pulling back on his promises, but God is showing us how God views sin. We've seen this so far throughout the prophets and we're going to continue to see them. Understand, from God's perspective, when we turn from Him and we choose sin, it is equivalent to stepping out on your spouse and engaging in intimacy with somebody else. God hates sin. God despises 
sin. And not just because God is some uh, big mean deity in the sky saying, hey, you should all worship me because I'm the most important. And we should. He is the most important. But it's also because God looks at us and he loves us and he made us in his image and he made us to know him and he made us to find pleasure and joy in him and he made us so that he could find pleasure and joy in us. He made us that we might love him and know him and he can be our father. So when humanity turns from him, it hurts the heart of God because sin, sin says, I want something completely opposite of who God is. Now before you think that the book of Hosea is just a book of just God being uh, all uh, judgment and hellfire and brimstone, flip over to chapter 3. So, there's a, a gap of time that happens between chapters 1 and chapters 3. We don't know how long that gap is, but kind of here's the timeline. God comes to Hosea, Hosea, go marry Gomer. And I'm just going to tell you in the front end, Gomer's going to start cheating on you. He goes, he marries Gomer, they have a kid. Gomer begins to cheat, and not just to cheat, I mean... The wording that the Bible uses, engaging in whoredom, playing the whore. This is not just a one-time act. This is not something that she is forced to do. She is choosing to say, hey, Hosea, you're gone. I'm kicking you to the curb. I'm going to go sleep with whoever I want to, however many times I want to, however many men I want to. This is how I'm going to live my life. Somewhere in that, after she has those two kids, no mercy in you are not my people, she finds herself... um, and somehow uh, sold into slavery. More than likely, she is sold into slavery as a prostitute. And so in chapter 3, God calls Hosea to go and to buy his wife back. Israel had sinned. Israel had engaged in all types of of immorality and idolatry, and it hurt the heart of God. And and because they had sinned, because they had broken his law and his commandment and his heart, punishment and judgment, uh, discipline was deserved. But understand, God made a promise all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 when he told Abraham, look, I'm going to make you a people and you will be my people, that God was not going to break. And so whenever you see in the Old Testament and you see God's judgment, 99% of the time it's followed up by God's grace. So look at chapter 3. The Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and who is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So he still loves them. He has not forsaken them, even though they have turned from him. Verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days, and you shall not play the whore uh, or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. There's that uh, that reuniting. You'll be mine, I will be yours. Verse 4. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. There's consequence to sin. Verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear of the Lord to his goodness in the latter days. In the midst of Israel's sin, in the midst of Israel saying, Hey God, we want to worship Baal and not you. Worshiping Baal seems like so much more fun than worshiping you, God. Even though he's fake, even though he's not real, and even though worshiping God or Baal leads to hell and judgment, this is what we want. And God says, fine, I'm going to let you have the results of that, the consequences of that, but understand, I still love you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm not giving up on you. I'm not throwing you aside. And this leads us to the theme of the book of Hosea. And here's what we got for the theme. Sin hurts the heart of, the heart of God. But God's grace and forgiveness is greater than the hurt we cause. No matter how great our sin is, God's mercy is greater. His mercy is more. Understand, one of the main things that we take from the prophets is we understand how horrific in God's eyes sin is. And I know I've said this before and I'll probably say it again. We are so prone to justify our sin. 
We make excuses for our sin. We say our sin is not that bad. Uh, uh, we put uh, our own pleasure or enjoyment or happiness or contentment or peace above uh, sin being bad or, or good or right or wrong. And understand, God never does that. Never, ever, ever. God looks at sin, and sin hurts the heart of God because here's what sin does. Sin says, hey, here's God and all his greatness and his love and his goodness and his majesty and his worth and how much he cares for me. And I'm going to go this way. And I'm going to willfully, brazenly turn my back on God and choose something that is less than him. Choose something that is not as good, that is not as great, that is not as powerful, that is not as loving. Every sin makes that choice. And in this picture of Hosea and Gomer, we see, her, we see our sin illustrated by Gomer's activities. And we see God's love illustrated by Hosea's. Gomer deserved, while she's sitting there on uh, this, this prostitution slavery trade block, or while she's sitting in someone's uh, house, to see Hosea walking down the street, to see Hosea look at her and just shake his head and kind of move on. That's what she deserved. She deserved to be left behind because of how she had treated him, because of what she had done. But God's command was not just go and buy her back, but go buy her back out of slavery and love her. Restore that relationship. It's not, hey, I'm going to hold this over your head, but she is yours and you are hers. Enter back into a loving, caring relationship. While we're here, let's go ahead and look at Jesus in Hosea. Because this is a picture of salvation for us. Understand, in this story, we're not Hosea. In this story, we're Gomer. We are the ones who have sinned. We are the ones who have turned our back on God. And the Bible tells us, Romans chapters 5, 6, and, and 7, tell us that our sin makes us slaves to sin and death. It makes us slaves to guilt. It makes us slaves to, to shame. But God so loved us that he sent his son to die. That for those who would turn to him, for those who would respond in faith, for those who would trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they would be saved. And he takes us who have whored after sin and idols, just like Gomer, and he says, I'm going to choose to love you, and I'm not going to buy you back with 15 shekels of silver and some barley. I'm going to buy you back by sending my son to come and die on a cross, to pay your penalty, so that when you trust me, you are brought back into the, you are brought into the family of God. Here's where we see Jesus in Hosea. Jesus died to literally buy us from the slave masters of sin and death, just as Hosea bought Gomer from the slavery, from slavery and prostitution. Understand, for those who do not know Jesus Christ, there's never come a time when you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You are as separated from God as Gomer was separated from Hosea in her, in her prostitution, in her slavery, in her, her whoredom. And the only way to get back to God is through the sacrifice of his son. It's through trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sin, turning from what you once were, what you once knew, and turning and surrendering your life to Him. For those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are not perfect. Every day we still fall short. But what does the Bible promise us? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Understand, even as believers, when we choose sin, we choose something less than God over God. But God in His love and His goodness and His grace always offers grace and forgiveness when we confess and we repent. And when we confess and repent, those sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. They are covered up. God remembers them no more. And our relationship with God is perfectly restored through the Son, Jesus Christ. All right. Let's look at some truths in Hosea. Now, I'm just saying by God's sovereignty and providence, we hit Hosea on Father's Day. Here's why that's important. 
The story of Hosea depends 100% on Hosea doing what God commands him to do and being the man that God wants him to be. The second Hosea says, hey God, this is too much for me. The second Hosea says, you know what God, I don't want to do that. The second Hosea says, hey God, I'm going to, I'm just, this, this is too much. I'm walking away. The picture falls apart. So God chose Hosea to be the prophet that, that, that engaged this story and engaged this truth in this way because he was a man of God. He was a man who loved God, a man who trusted God, a man who wanted to glorify God. God calls the prophets to do some funny things. He told Isaiah to go preach naked to the nation of Israel for three years. Uh, he told Ezekiel to lay on his side for over 400 days as a sign of prophecy and then to, to cook his food over human dung. But what God tells Hosea is it's, it's a step past that. For the rest of your life, your life is this picture of my love and of my grace for my people. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. So this morning, what I want us to look at is what does it mean to be a man? To be a man that honors God, to be a man that, that God uses, to be a man that glorifies God. Honestly, you talk to 20 different people, you say, what is a man? You might get 20 different explanations. Some people think the man uh, uh, has to be like an action hero, John Wick or Rambo. Some think a man de depends on uh, your, your status in your job or your status with your possessions, the size of your bank account, the type of clothes that you wear, your car, your truck, your boat. They look at all these things and say, if I'm a man, then I've got X, Y, and Z, or I do this, that, and the other. Looking at Hosea's life, we're going to look at two things, or three things, that I think God, we see throughout all of Scripture, but are modeled in Hosea's life, of what it means to be a, a man. Now, ladies, this does not mean that, that you're taking the morning off, uh, but this is how you can pray for the, the men in your life. This is what you look at the men in your life and what you should, should hope for and respect and, and pray towards and hope that they are, are moving towards. If you have sons or grandsons, nephews, this is what you should be, be pouring into their life so that they can grow up and be the men that God wants them to be. All right, so the first thing. Men love and obey God even when it isn't easy. Men love and obey God even when it isn't easy. Can you imagine being Hosea? God comes to you and calls you to being a prophet. And maybe there's this instant thing of, hey, that's incredible. That's awesome. I get to be a prophet and take God's word and take God's message. And then he says, yeah, and here's what that's going to look like. You're going to marry this girl and she's going she's to cheat on you over and over and over and over again. Talk about the letdown. Talk about how, how hard that had to be. Talk about once it was all said and done and chapter 3 rolls around and he's got to go back and buy her back and not just say, all right, we've got to share a house together, but I'm going to love you. Think of how hard that was. But also, what does Hosea do? He does what God tells him to do. He follows God's commandment. As God lays it out, says, here's who I want you to be. Here's what I want you to do. Hosea says, all right, God, I'm surrendering to you. I will be the man that you want me to be. Being a man is not about how much weight you can lift. It's not about the athlete that you are. Being a man is not about... Being a man is about loving God, following his commandments, doing what he has called us to do, being who he has called us to be. Hosea could have sat back and said, God, that's too much. I don't want to do that. God, that's, that's too hard for me. Instead, he said, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to be who you want me to be. I'm going to love how you want me to love. I'm going to live how you want me to live. That's what being a man is about. It doesn't matter if you're masculine. It doesn't matter if you're effeminate. Being a man is about following and trusting and obeying God. Being a man is about recognizing who God is and surrendering your life wholly and fully to Him. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be hiccups along the way. It doesn't mean that we're going to fall short sometimes. 
But being a man also means confessing. It means repenting. It means turning to God in humility and saying, God, I fail. God, please forgive me. And trusting God's grace to pick you back up and to forgive you. Being a man, first and foremost, the most important relationship in your life is between you and God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Then comes your wife, then comes your kid, then comes your church and your job and everything else. But first and foremost comes God. doesn't matter how big your truck is, how new your boat is, how big your house is, how big your bank account is, what your job is, what your title is, how many people have to answer to you. None of that matters. None of that, from God's perspective, makes you manly. What makes you manly is do you know God, do you love God, and do you follow God? Now, God's probably not going, God doesn't have prophets in this same sense. So God's probably not calling any of us uh, to go and, and marry someone who, he's not going to tell us ahead of time, hey, this is what's going to happen, because your life is a picture for me. But God has given us a lot of commandments. God has told us who he wants us to be. And Micah says, God has told us who he wants you to be. Love justly, do mercy, walk humbly with your God. That's who God wants us to be. Not people who justify sin. Not people who place ourselves above Him or above what He wants us to do. But people who live in submission to who He is. So first, men obey God even when it isn't easy. Secondly, men love their wives in the good and the bad. So twice Hosea is called to take a wife. I want you just to listen to the difference in the language here. In verse 2 he says, when the Lord spoke, first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom. He says, look, this is what's going to happen. Take your wife, this is what's going to happen. Look at, and in chapter 3 it says this, the Lord said to me, go ahead, or go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. On the front end, God says, go take a wife, and this is what's going to happen. Almost kind of matter-of-factly. The second, which is honestly the harder call, because everything has already happened. He says, go and love her. Go and love her. Even though she's loved by another, that's not affectionate love, that is physical love. Even though she has been an adulteress, go and love her. Understand, that might not have been the easiest thing for Hosea to do either. And not just because of the the physicality of her actions, but understand, even though Hosea knew what was coming up, more than likely Hosea loved Gomer. And when Gomer began to chase after other men, it hurt Gomer's heart. And we know that because this is a picture of God in Israel, and it hurt God's heart when we sin. And so as, as Hosea sees Gomer going and living this way, running away from him, running into the arms of other men, it hurts. And now God's saying, hey, go to this lady who has chosen other men other than you, who has has run away from you, and not just bring her back into your house to share a roof, but love her. Love her. Care for her. Put her needs above your own. Put her desires above your own. Put her worth above your own. Regardless of what has happened in the past, forget the past, move forward loving your wife. Throughout the Bible, or in the New Testament, the... uh, relationship of a husband and wife is is pictured through Christ and the church. In Ephesians 5, when Paul's writing and he writes to the the, the church of Ephesus and he writes to the women, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, He follows that up in a much larger section saying, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ forgives the church. Christ died for the church. Christ sacrificed for the church. Christ is Christ's desire for the church is for the church's good, for God desires, for God works all things for good for those who love God and calling to his purpose. Those who love God are calling to his purpose, that's the church. God desires the good of the church. Christ desires the good of his bride, the church. 
Look, in the, that passage in Ephesians is written in such a way where Paul is saying, Hey guys, if you want your wife to follow your leadership, if you want your wife to recognize you are the head and follow you willfully and joyfully, then love her like Christ loved the church. Lay your hurt down. Lay your pride down. Lay, lay everything down and exalt her. Lift her up to where she is second only towards God or only to God in your life. Value her. Be compassionate towards her. Be gracious towards her. Love her in such a way where she says, I know that, I, that God loves me the most. My husband is, a, is a, the closest second that there's going to be. That my husband loves me more than my parents do or my children do or my extended family does. God's call to men is to love your spouse more than you love yourself. God's call to men is to, to sacrifice and to lay your life down for the sake of somebody else. But your wife comes first. Your children come second. God comes first. Then your wife. Then your children. Then job and work and everything. And you come down at the, at the bottom. That you put yourself last. And then if you get lifted up or someone wants to do something nice for you, then that's on them. But you put yourself last. And you put everyone else above yourself. That's what it means to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That what it, that's what it means. We'll look at leadership in a second, but to be a leader. Leaders don't put themselves first. Leaders put others first. Leaders look for the benefit of others. Hosea could have said, look, God, I just want to be happy. This is too hard. There's too much baggage here. God, you don't understand. But God does understand. And God says, love your wife. We're here, let me just say this. Understand in marriages, I believe wholeheartedly that God's desire is always reconciliation. Whenever there is conflict in a marriage, from the smallest thing, like not loading the dishwasher or taking the trash out, to the biggest things, like our marriage is about to end, God's desire is always reconciliation. God's desire is always forgiveness. God's desire is always to come back and, and, and to be one, to, to be uh, uh, a unit, to be together, to know God, to love God, and make an impact in families and in the church and the world around us. That's God's desire. And let me just say this too. Divorce is not an unforgivable sin. If you found yourself in a divorce, understand there's a couple of, of, of qualifications that God even allows for it. Uh, we won't get into all that right now. But if you found yourself in a divorce, understand, God does not hate you. God does not say, I can't use you anymore. Uh, you're not a second-class citizen. But if you're in a marriage, no matter if it is great, no matter if it is hard right now, God's will for you, and I will say this, and if I'm wrong, then God can shoot me with a lightning bolt. God's will for you is reconciliation between husband and wife. That is God's will. If you are in a marriage and you have not yet gotten to the end of that marriage, God's desire, wherever you are at, is that you be reconciled. That is God's will. According to the law, Hosea had every right to never take Gomer back. She had committed adultery multiple times. And God says, go and love your wife. Third and final point. Men light or lead the way for their families. I'll tell you why I put light in just a second. God has called men to leadership. And look, leadership doesn't mean everyone serves you. Leadership doesn't mean that you uh, go to work and you come home and kick off your feet and the, the kids are fanning you with uh, branches and your wife's feeding you grapes that she skinned by hand. That's not leadership. I don't know what that is, but it's not biblical. It's not good. Leadership means that you move and you push towards the good of whatever you are leading. And in your families, you are leading your family. And I would dare say that the spiritual health of your family rests on your shoulders, men. The spiritual health of your family sits heavy on, on the shoulders that God has called you to be a leadership, to be, uh, to be in leadership. Leaders look for the good of others. 
Leaders help people move to where they need to go. Leaders work hard and go to bed tired, trying to get everyone else to, to be where they need to be, working to see the benefit and the good for everybody else. And I know we like talking about, hey, men are the head of the household and women are to submit. And that's biblical, and that's right. But you know what head of the household means? It doesn't mean that you get to boss everybody around. It means that you bear the weight of leadership. It means that you lead the way, good and bad. It means that you bear a lot of responsibility. Now, we need wives to encourage us. We can't do it on our own. We need God in our life to strengthen us. We need our wives to, to come alongside of us and help hold us up many times. But that weight of leadership, men, it sits on you. It does. It sits on me. So my question is, are we leading our families? Well, no, that's not the question, because we are leading our families. The question is, how are we leading our families? Where are we leading our families to? What are we teaching our wives about, about who God is by how we love them? What are we teaching our children? Are we teaching them that sports are more important than God, that school and grades are more important? What are we teaching them is the most valuable thing in their lives? We are leading somewhere. Where are we leading? So for our Father's Day gifts, we've got these little uh, flashlights that say Farmstead Baptist Church. Uh, I don't know what that is. Can we, I'm about to have a seizure or something up here. I don't know what's going on. Little flashlights. That's something. Uh, Part of it's just a little gift that you can keep, but part of it, let it be a reminder that in life, God has called me to be the one to, to light, to lead the way for my family. God has called me to be the one to, to, to show my, my wife what it means uh, that God loves her by, how, by how, how I love her. That God has called me to lead my children and to lead them to Christ. That God has called me to set a standard in my family of what it means to know God and love God and follow God. That even if that means difficulty for me, even in the good, even in the bad, even in the heart, I'm going to do what God calls me to do because God has called me to lead my family. I'm going to love when I'm not loved in return. I'm going to show grace when I'm not shown grace in return. I'm going to show forgiveness if I'm not shown forgiveness in return. That I'm going to lead. I'm going to set the standard. I'm going to set the example of what it means to follow God. Paul writes to the churches, follow me as I follow Christ. That should be our goal, men. We're not going to be perfect. We have to depend on God and His grace and His forgiveness. But we should be able to say to our families, follow me as I follow Christ. How are we leading our families? 